uh, I'm really glad that uh, the organizers invited me here. And uh, I'd like to thank them for that. I haven't been to Berkeley before, and this is my first uh, time. And uh, it's nice, warm, and it's uh, good to talk about uh, Bayesian analysis. So my title is Bayesian Data Analysis, and I modified it from Bayesian Statistics because I'm really going to talk about analysis, mostly, because this is what we do. And uh, statisticians worry about the proper statistical properties of mathematical expressions and definitions. So uh, we as astronomers, uh, using the tools that they developed, and these tools help us to um, have the inference about our problem, st uh, scientific inference. So I'm, um, I'm an astronomer, and I'm working with Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, which uh, I started, uh, I mean, I started this work 20 years ago. And this is also the time when we tried to define the challenges in the new data which were coming up. So 20 years ago was 1996. Uh, we were thinking about uh, future of X-ray astronomy and X-ray data. We didn't know what comes in, but uh, we predicted that there will be some problems. So at that time, my boss suggested that I will go to uh, statistics department and talk to statisticians and ask them um, how to deal with the problems and challenges which we face. So this is where uh, the task astrostatistics formed. Um, and uh, it's been 20 years. So let's see if this works. Oh, it does. All right. I don't know if I can zoom this, but uh, let's see. We can do that way. So we have uh, a web page. Uh, and uh, my first meeting was with uh, Don Rubin, who was the dean of, uh, or chair of the stats department at the time. And he suggested that the new um, professor, David Van Dyke, will start collaborating with us because he's interested in new problems. So this is where uh, David Van Dyke, his students, me, Alana Connors, uh, sit down and discuss how to approach the X-ray analysis in a Bayesian way. We didn't have a clue what the Bayesian was, or maybe Alana actually did. She introduced me to Bayesian problems. But uh, at the time, it was uh, something new and uh, possibly something which will help us to um, analyze the data. So. This is, uh, this is the history of uh, our collaboration, statistics collaboration. And if you go to the very bottom, this is the uh, <coughs> sorry, this is 1997 paper here in which we defined uh, the problem. It was presented at the Penn State uh, Statistical Challenges in Modern Astronomy meeting, which uh, Eric Feigelson and Jogesh Babu organized during the last uh, 25, 30 years. So in 90s, this was the place where you could learn about new things in statistics. This is where first uh, Bayesian statistical analysis uh, paper or uh, manuscript was published. It was by Tom Loretto. This was the paper for astronomy, I should say. And in that uh, 1992 um, conference proceedings, there was this Bayesian um, analysis uh, definitions for astronomers. And then in our, our short paper was basically about the challenges we will face. OK, so you know, 20 years later, this is the you know, conferences. These are the things we do, and uh, some software. And, uh, we have this meeting with statisticians. We work with students, and uh, we develop algorithms. They take long time. If you start with your new problem and you come to statisticians, they want to understand every 
detail about that problem. They want to know where the data comes from, what do you know about the data, and how, you know, what do you really want to get. So they ask you all these questions, so you need to be prepared to answer those. And then during the process of thinking about the method, you understand that not all the questions they ask you answered correctly, or you were confused. So um, it was a big uh, experience for me and uh, evolution in my knowledge of statistics, which is very great, because now I'm standing here. 20 years ago, the probability that I will come and give you this lecture was less than 0.001, or even less, probably. At that time, nobody talked about statistics, Bayesian statistics, and people didn't care. Now, um, of course, situations is very different. So we'll come back to that later. But first, uh, these are some, you know, some statistics of uh, publications in ABJ. So when you look at the word, I just search ADS for Bayesian word in ABJ publications. So you have the shooting up uh, number of papers which say Bayesian analysis. I'm not sure if they actually do that. And then MCMC, uh, which is Markov chain Monte Carlo method, in refereed papers also increases. So you can look at that uh, growth of uh, usage or application of Bayesian analysis in astronomy, and it's great. Uh, the main problem is that uh, maybe not everybody understands details of the processing of the data, the details of applications, but you know, we, are, we are getting there, I think, which is very nice. So um, I was thinking about uh, telling you where to find the information, because of course I'm not a statistician. I've worked with statisticians, but I'm not a statistician. And uh, I'm probably, you know, I can tell myself that I'm an astrostatistician, but I'm more astro than statistician. So the reference is, uh, I put the three books here. Uh, the first one is uh, a popular reading uh, from Nate Silver, and it is a great introduction uh, about probability thinking probabilistic thinking uh, for us, because he describes standard events in our world and uh, applies the base rules to explain those. So there are examples from poker games, from the election, from history. Uh, and one interesting uh, example which he g gives is the um, discovery example and the usage of technology. So he says that the big breakthrough in our knowledge or our applications comes with the big event and big discovery. And he gives the example of the Gutenberg discovery of print. So when you think about books before Gutenberg, the books were very expensive. The knowledge was not generally new, uh, applicable or searchable. After Gutenberg uh, application of print of printing, the amount of books which people can read started to increase, and the knowledge started to circulate around. And this is this is something which um, brought the evolution revolution to our world because uh, people be, uh, started being more knowledgeable and the war started, things shifted around and uh, the whole industry revolution came in 17th, 18th century. And since then, the things started growing very, very quickly. So when you look at the w internet now, and which is sort of similar case, to you know, sharing information in 15th century, we are having a lot of information, a lot of data, and we're trying to figure out what to do with it. So we are maybe at the edge of revolution, even in astronomy, 
when you look at these graphs and our you know, papers uh, with Bayesian analysis going up, then you know, maybe that's something which um, reflects this uh, change um, which is coming. The main reference for Bayesian data analysis is this red book by Andrew Gelman. It's a very big book. It's the textbook for statisticians. And as somebody told me, it is very hard reading. Uh, but it gives you all the details about uh, Bayesian thinking and definitions. Um, if you read first four chapters, maybe six, you will have uh, coverage of everything you may need to know in order to understand Bayesian analysis. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> but it is hard reading, and it may not take uh, you, you know, a month. It can take a few years, but uh, it's, it's really good. And this is the third edition. Uh, I know I was reading the, se the second edition um, 15 years ago, and this was uh, hard reading. And I don't tell you that I understand everything which is written in that book either. <laughs> so for astronomers, there is a very short, small uh, book, which you can probably read um, in a week or two. Um, and it's uh, Wallen Jenkins, Jenkins, Practical Statistics for Astronomers. It's very nice. Gives you a lot of examples from astronomy. And it is a mixture of standard classical approach and Bayesian analysis. And I like that book. Um, it gives you sort of a quick introduction to it. All right. 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 Exactly. So yes, uh, it has bas it covers a lot of. Uh, oh yeah, the microphone. It covers a lot of uh, things which we need to know the definition of, right? So if you hear a word, this is where you can find the description of it, and it has examples, and these examples can help you. You can work through examples. It's very good. So topics, I listed all the topics here, uh, which cover the standard uh, analysis. I'm not sure we will get, get into all of them, but I wanted to have them listed um, in terms of you know, what they are. Uh, I structured this uh, lecture into three components. Uh, and it will start with components of Bayesian analysis, talk about models and inference, and then model checking and model selections. Uh, you had some discussion of probability on Monday. Uh, this is just to uh, come back to it. And uh, in normal ways, probability quantifies randomness, basically. That's what it is. And statistics uses the probability to make the scientific inferences. So this is sort of connection between statistics and probability. And we, as scientists, have to use statistics in order to provide scientific inference. If we don't use statistics, then we're just talking uh, in a normal conversation with somebody. We have to have some measure of our inference and statistics provide us this with this measure we also have to have a way to decide about certain things certain models or certain views of the world world so this is where statistics comes and helps us monday discussion about bayesian and frequentist approach uh, give you gave you the introduction to uh, the differences so I just put here that Bayesian probability quantifies the degree of 
belief that an event occur, and the frequentest is the frequentest understanding of probability is that this is the frequency of an event occurring in the limited or limit on infinite number of trials, which in astronomy will be very hard to do, because our source observed by the X-ray telescope once may be observed second time, but the state of that source can vary. We know that X-ray sources vary. So for us, it is very hard to repeat the experiment. And uh, we usually think about uh, our experiments in a Bayesian way uh, most of the time. Okay. Then we have probability distributions, which uh, are sort of formation of uh, our probability thinking. And uh, this is the example of uh, the decision process in which we will basically reject the hypothesis which gives you this distribution plotted as histogram because it's the probability that this event at you know, 6.8 came uh, as a part of that model describes the rest is very small. It's less than 1.6%. So we would say it's very unlikely that this is the, uh, the event related to whatever we were talking about. So we decide based on that test that uh, we reject whatever the model told us about something. Probability distribution uh, have uh, the formal mathematical prescription. So we have this continuous uh, probability function, which is called probability density function. And uh, probability of random variable takes a value between x and x plus dx. It's formalized here. And the probability that x is between this uh, two values is basically the integral between those. So you know those things. All right. We talked uh, about joint, marginal, and conditional probability um, of the x and y. And uh, let's see if we can illustrate that a little bit. Or maybe somebody can illustrate things. So if I say this is x and y, and let's see, this is my scatter points, and I sort of draw things like that. So what is the joint probability of x and y on that plot? Anybody? Can you tell me? What is the joint probability? When you look at this x and y, what is the joint probability of x and y? Yes, everything. So any point in, on this plane, if it's just two variables, right? Any point on the plane tells us about probability density, sort of. Uh, of course, there is this uh, the density of the point with points which I use the density. So you have I put the contours and there is more points here, less points here. So you know if point is in located, x and y is here, the p of x y will be higher than here, for example. But anything on that plane will be the joint probability. So what is the marginal probability of x on that plane? The, you know, the integral is there, so you should be able to <laughs> integrate, right? So can you plot that? Yes, exactly. That's the histogram. <laughs> Very good. So you know, we'll do this and sort of Maybe histogram, maybe this function like that. I don't know, something like that, right? Um, 
So what is the probability, conditional probability? Yes. So for fix x, right, you just uh, have to integrate over these little bits here, right? So there is, the, there is the curve which will be in that direction somehow. If you read, yeah, I don't know how to plot that, but it will, will be some, somewhere, somewhere like this. Yes, exactly. It's it's a little harder to illustrate, but it it will be you know even if anything in that sort of part of the graph. Okay, because we fixed one value. So I wanted to say something about the notation, which uh, means that for us, sometimes it's very hard to read the statistics books and also talk to statisticians. Uh, so for the distributions which are you know, known, binomial, Poisson, normal, chi-square, and t distribution, we think about distribution of the equation typically, and uh, when those equations are put into the probability statements, they become very hard to read. So the way to um, describe those in a complex uh, statements, these are the, the ways um, the notation is sort of simplified. So if you see bin n on p, you know that this is binomial distribution. And Poisson is Poisson rate. It's obvious. <laughs> and then normal would be Gaussian with the mean, mu, and uh, standard deviation. The chi-square distribution and t distribution. There are gamma distributions. There is many distributions. And uh, I think as an exercise, I have some exercises for you. So as an exercise, I was suggesting you plot some of them, or you simulate uh, the data from so those distributions. But uh, you know there are so many tools out there. So when we write the code, uh, you usually go to the library and you call, you know, let's say NumPy random, and you say random uh, normal or random multivariate normal. And you don't care about the equation at this point. You just care about the parameters of the distribution. So it's sort of similar to the way statisticians think about these distributions, because they also think about the parameters uh, in that context. Of course, they know the equations, and they you know, deeply understand all the transformations and things that need to be done. But when, you know, when they write things to simplify this, they, they use this notation. So for us, if you code something, you just have to sort of understand the properties of these distributions and then use them, which is uh, nice. Let me see what else I have on this. OK, so there is more to the notations. Uh, I guess we talked about probabilities. But when you say, you know, let's say theta is the parameter of a model, and it could be 1, could be 10, 20, often. And you say the parameter is sort of distributed as normal with mu and sigma square. So this would tell you that the parameters are distributed as the Gaussians, and there is certain mean for <laughs> these parameters. For one parameter of, if there is many, this would be multivariate Gaussian with you know, many mu's and many sigmas, some correlations between those. Um, and then probability of theta could be written as normal mu of sigma square. So something like that. I guess this could, this could be, this is, this is random variable, and that's the probability of that variable, which could be normal. 
Uh, and then probability of theta given mu and sigma square. I mean, this is a variance, yes? Oh, that's a better one, okay. Yeah, sorry. My writing is bad, but if you can't even see that, it's even worse, right? <laughs> have to have those. Okay, so uh, we, when you say uh, about probability density, uh, we, s we put normal here as well. So it will be normal. And there will be theta given mu and sigma. Oh, oh. that's surprising. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, okay, these are the three uh, main notations. So, this is our probability of model parameter given the these parameters of the distribution, right? And this tells us that it's normal. Let's see, like that. Normal given those. Why would you ever write the middle one? Uh, well, if you think about prior, this is what you would write, right? If you think about what uh, you think about the parameters, and you can say, okay, my parameters, let's say, slope, and those values are distributed in according to certain uh, distribution, which is normal, with that mean and that range. But, uh, okay, so if you fix mu and sigma, mm -hmm. Right, okay. right. You mean this one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's w yes, but this, yeah, yeah. The the yeah, yeah. So this is where you know when you go and read uh, some statistical text, you need to have the cheat sheet on the side until you learn. I mean, this is like learning different language, right? You don't know all the words and uh, you learn. And uh. so actually, on our task web page, we created the dictionary for astronomers to understand statistics and for statisticians to understand astronomers. Because when we started talking, we couldn't communicate clearly because our language, astronomy language, is so bad, or was so bad, that they didn't understand what we were talking about. So we, have to, we had to do that, which was uh, a good uh, exercise. But now I looked at the dictionary, and uh, it has a lot of mix missing spots, so we have to update it. It is on task web page. It's called stats jargon. Go there. Okay. So let's go. All right. I was uh, talking about distribution, so I wanted to uh, suggest you one exercise which you can do. You can uh, try to compare Poisson and uh, Gaussian distributions, which we all know and we all use, because those are very common in astronomy. Um, so for low counts numbers, we really have to use uh, the proper Poisson. So this graphs, graph one graph and then the next one, show the difference. So the curves, uh, black curves, show the Gaussian distributions with mean two and mean five. And the dots illustrate the Poisson distribution with uh, rate 2 and rate 5. And you can see that those are very different. So if you're dealing with a very small number of counts, you know, you, for counts I mean not on the only X-ray counts, when you have two galaxies in the population of galaxies and or you sample you know, one and two or three or five, you need to think about Poisson case. But, uh, you know, if you go to higher numbers, uh, number of counts, these distributions become closer and closer together. So 
you know, for 40 counts, so mean, mean of 40 and so the 40 rate in Poisson, those uh, shapes are very similar. So you can do this uh, and play with all the distributions. This is just uh, Poisson versus Gaussian, but uh, you know you go to your random uh, library and there is you know beta and binomial distributions. So try with different parameters and illustrate, you know, plot them, and get a feeling of how they look, because this gives you the uh, sort of intuition about problems. When you think about uh, your scientific question and definitions which come into your uh, description of the problem, if you have the intuition and you sort of see where, you know, what would be applicable, then it's uh, nicer. You know? So, you know, practicing this is, is good. So now, <laughs> Bayesian data analysis, right? What is it? So the main component, there are the sort of these three components that the, uh, usually we're setting up the full probability model for the problem. So you uh, look at the joint probability distribution of everything, observable and unobservable. So what you know, what you can observe, what could be observed in the future. So every, all the quantities of the problem you, you're going to face. Then you condition on the observed data to calculate and uh, interpret posterior distribution. And then, of course, you evaluate at the end the model checks and evaluate the fit of the model and the implication of this posterior distribution. So one problem with the Bayesian analysis was that, this is the past, right? was that calculating the posterior distribution was very hard uh, because before the computers, you really have, had to do things analytically. And as we show later, approaching the analytical calculation Calculations is very hard in the Bayesian way because you start getting into this uh, very strange functions, gamma distributions, beta distributions, and you have to integrate them somehow. So people didn't use Bayesian uh, formalism mostly because they had problems with uh, these applications. Um, very uh, important strand of the Bayesian analysis is this last point, that when you finish your calculations, you have the full understanding of the posterior distribution and the fit, right? So you basically learned what you could given what you observed. You cannot learn more because that's what you already put into your model. So the only thing you could do is to say, you know, what do I need to do next? Is it really uh, feasible, what, they are, what I already observed? I'm done. I have my conclusion, and it's a perfect conclusion. Or should I go and do um, more observations? So this final point of the analysis is actually very important in, uh, um, in Bayesian. Uh, applications, and as uh, you will see tomorrow in the sampling uh, tutorial, there are tricks or you know s confusing places where you have to understand what's happening when you do this. Okay. So these are the building blocks now of Bayesian inference. You talked about sampling distribution and likelihood which uh, tells us how likely is the data, given what uh, parameters of our models are. What are the priors? So what do we know about these parameters? And then the Bayes theorem, which is defining the uh, posterior distribution. 
And this is the simplification, of course, because there was a normalization factor, but we don't care about normalization, usually. It's one of those things which you say marginalize, integrate out, and forget about it. These are the, the most important uh, parts of the Bayes theorem, which uh, we understand and we need to use. Right? So let's talk about those. Oh, now I have a little bit more about Bayesian inference. So this is based on uh, the Red Book statements. There is, if you go to one of the sections, don't remember exactly where, there are this trend and some additional point about Bayesian inference. So the strand, as I already said, that we combine all the information about the problem, and we also, this is important, we also input the uncertainties into those uh, calculations. So it takes everything into account, right? Uh, some additional points. So Bayesian data analysis is based on parameters and on models with parameters. There is some new development on approximate base, non-parametric base right now, but these are new avenues in statistics. And what we, we do in astronomy, we apply Bayesian um, framework to our uh, analysis in that way that we have models sometimes with many parameters. And there are problems, of course, if you have many parameters in your model, because setting the full probability model for or full probability statistical model, I should say, with many parameters is very tricky. So it's tricky to set it up and also to do the, the full inference because your posterior becomes very scary, right, with all the bumps everywhere. So you have to uh, be willing to use these many parameters. You have to, if you have these many parameters, you have to think about structuring the problem into this hierarchy where you can maybe separate certain parameters into the structure of your approach. So not saying this is my full posterior or likelihood and prior with all the parameters in one, one line, because this may be very hard to handle. You think about hierarchy of those parameters, and maybe you can calculate them first and then use them as a step in the next calculation. There is model checking. Uh, we'll talk about model checking. So there is also emphasis on inference in the forms of distributions. So when you get your result from Bayesian analysis, what you get is the posterior distribution. It's not just maximum likelihood. And this is the main difference between the point estimate approach, which is uh, often found in the frequentist uh, methods, where you're interested in one value which characterizes your model. So point estimate versus the full posterior distribution. And this is important, and maybe I need to actually say something uh, on the side right now, because as you saw, uh, we have a lot of work uh, applied Bayesian methods in our problems and publications. And there is a critical point on propagating the posterior distribution or your result from Bayesian analysis into the publication. So how do you publish what you learned? And I think it's not solved because we don't have normal data structures, you know, FITS files, how do you handle the posterior, uh, the, the distribution which is sort of result of your MCMC at the end, right? Because that's what you do. So you, you get all your samples, you have, you know, 100,000 data points 
from your posterior, where do you put them? There is no place in Abde or mostly notices for it. So I was thinking that this could be one of the additional breakout sessions just to brainstorm about possibility of uh, defining the way to publish the result of our analysis. That's what you know, I, yesterday I was like, oh, this is the group of people who uh, are passionate about computing. They really want to do this analysis. So let's uh, give them this problem. So it's a, and this is the computational problem or database problem or you know, whatever you frame it. But I think it's important because uh, we have to have a way to propagate that information. Uh, often you publish just the summaries of uh, your results. So you, know, you see the histograms in the parameters. But this is only partial information. Because you can imagine that if you had the information about the full posterior, and you read that paper, then you can take this and maybe apply as part of your analysis to the, in the next step. Right? So it's not only to show the result, it's also to show and use it later on, which is I th important, I think. Um, yeah, the use of simulations we know. So you have all MCMC and uh, let's simulate. right? Um, Use of probability models as tools for understanding and possibly improving our techniques. And this may not really involve Bayesian models. It can involve other things. Um, so include as much information as possible. And uh, then you look at the data as the random sample. So you can take the the data and include in your analysis because that's the random sample from your posterior. So it's part of this analysis. And uh, you need to be willing to design studies of the inference, um, which is robust to the model assumptions. Often, people say, well, don't do Bayes because you really skew your final result because you put all you know in this prior and then what you get is what you put in the prior. Well, it means that your prior is wrong, your model is wrong, and your approach is wrong. So it's not that uh, the base is wrong, it's just what you did is wrong. right? So you have to be careful about those. All right. Oh. Hmm. Maybe we will do this one thing <laughs> and then we'll take a break. I feel like I'm talking too much, so we have to do some calculations. All right, I find mine. So likelihood of one data point. OK, so what, uh, if we have just one, uh, I was thinking about the event, where is this? If we have. Uh, one observation, let's say, one star, and it comes from the normal distribution. Uh, we know that that's the likelihood of that normal distribution will be just the standard Gaussian equation. Uh, do I need to write? Yeah, I probably need to write the, the normal. What I really wanted to do was to uh, write the Poisson. So maybe we'll do the Poisson. I'll leave you uh, to work through normal uh, by yourself. Because it's, uh, I think it's uh, sort of more intuitive, maybe. So Poisson example, right? So we have the Poisson, Poisson observation. And you know, I have my notebook, because uh, I don't think I can do all this derivation uh, just from my head. So I use my cheat sheet. <laughs> OK, so we have the Poisson. And we have one observation from, from the Poisson. So we will do this. So uh, 
one observation, which is y. That's my observation from the Poisson distribution. So this is my parameters, right? And this is my Poisson over y sigma, right? So y here is, uh, in this case, is just one observation. And that's the Poisson equation for you. And theta is the models. Uh, in the case of Poisson, it will be the rate um, of uh, the, let's say, counts coming towards you. Um, so someti sometimes the, uh, this rate parameter includes our exposure time in it because uh, you, know, you can define the Poisson in terms of the time, arrival times, and the rate. Um, it goes into this one here. So for single observation, this looks like this. If we have multiple observations, uh, then you know, we have y, which is y, yn. Right? So we have the array of, let's say, we have spectrum, we have 50 channels in uh, x-rays, and we have this 50 little Poisson uh, arrivals in those. So to define the likelihood now, what you need to do is to basically write the Poisson for the whole thing, right? So again, y here is the tau, and we do the, you know, i to, I said uh, n, let's say, let's do n. 1 over y i sigma. This is actually easy right now. It become, became, will become a little bit more complex later. So this is my likelihood, right? So I multiply all the probabilities for all the channels. Uh, one exercise which I suggest you also do, and I think I will have it at the end of this lecture, I have uh, suggested exercises on the different form which I will put into the Astrohack uh, page. So that's the uh, multiplication of all of those. So we'll do some tricks and uh, I hope you, un you, you do math, right? So uh, you, you do those uh, things. So you can say yi is, uh, so there is sort of sum of i the way I, we can define this as the, you know, just the summation. So if, when you do that, then you can rewrite this as, uh, you know, theta to t of y e to minus theta, sort of proportional. Okay. So now, and this is, a, this is, oh no, there is one, one end missing, sorry. So, you know, you, you can actually go from one to the other uh, in your, so n times theta. Can you derive this on, and you don't have your notebooks. Nobody does math in their notebooks anymore. You just use computers. But, you know, you can, you can try, you know, exponent is really nice. So when you expand this, you get theta, uh, to t y e to minus n theta. So you can do that. Now, the property of the exponent, right? So it's funny, you know, this is something which people did in high school. So um, what do we do? So natural log, how do we do this theta? Okay, theta t of y you do this, it will be e to t of y times log of theta. This is natural log always, right? This is just from the property of the exponent. So when you use this tool, you get something interesting. Because uh, 
when you put this thing here, you can write this in the form of, let's see, rewrite a little, e to minus n, so a theta, theta n, is it too low? No, no, e to mu log mu log theta. You can define the prior because these things look similar. So if you ask about prior for Poisson, you would write you know, sort of this equivalent here. And in this case, this uh, new and uh, this should be eta. So that's a different, that's not n. So this would be the parameters called hyperparameters, mu and theta here. So the likelihood has the form of, where is it? We lost it, okay, the likelihood, I go back and I write it here, so people can see. The likelihood have, has this form, p of a, e to minus b of theta, that's our likelihood, right? You can think about this too as parameters. And then the prior looks similar. So prior on theta will have sort of form like this, typically a e to minus b theta. Which sometimes it's written as basically e to minus theta tau, theta to alpha minus one. So this, if you go back to the distribution, is basically the gamma distribution. And uh, you can work through equations yourself again and uh, derive things and go and look at the distribution equations later, what's important is that the gamma distribution is so-called conjugate to the Poisson distribution. So it's often used as a prior for the Poisson problem. And it comes through this. It means, conjugate means in, it's in the same family of functions, right? So in this case, if you think about priors, for your Poisson problem, you often get into the gamma priors. And you know, as an astronomer, it's like, what gamma prior, why, right? I mean, this is why, because these functions are very uh, much connected, and when you use these functions, especially in the past, when there was no computers, the calculations could be actually done, right? Now, in the era of computers, we don't care about uh, the distributions as much, or conjugate, conjug I don't know how to pronounce that, <laughs> or having a conjugate prior, because even in the case where you have this prior, which comes from completely different uh, part of the math, you can still do it because you have computer, right? So. You can derive this too. That's a nice exercise. Uh, what, el what else I have here before we break? Uh, let me see. I lost my the computer. It's gone. It's no, I don't have it here. So um, uh, no, it's like I don't have anything on my computer. So I think this is a break. Okay, <laughs> we'll fix it because I, you know, my computer crashes sometimes. But uh, uh, that's maybe a good time to break. Uh, ten minutes, right? Um, do you want to take two breaks? Or? Yeah, I'll probably take two breaks. Okay, great. Then we'll yeah. do ten minutes. Ten minutes now and then ten minutes later. I cannot talk for you know long time. Always. All right.
if I need it. Yeah. All right. Maybe, yeah. I mean, if we end up writing more, then yes. Okay, we got coffee, chocolates. Now we go. Um, Okay. So how should we think about them? Are they these days, are they just a sort of potential speed up? That if you're willing to approximate your prior with a concrete form, then it's Yeah, I I guess that's the main reason to use it. You know, in the past, if you had conjugate prior, you could do your analytical cal calculations better. Now to speed up and to uh, maybe better understand your problem because some of the priors may not be of that family and could be different. But uh, I don't know if astronomers care about conjugate priors because we usually have some prior knowledge about our problem and we apply that knowledge and that's our prior, right? So when you set up the statistical model, then yes, you you may talk to your Colleague, colleague, statistician, which I actually tell you that the best way to learn and develop your Bayesian uh, modeling is to find a statistician and uh, work with them. Because uh, you either do statistics or you either do astronomy. It's very hard to do both. So we are, as a st statisticians, trying to do both, but it always, if you want to develop a new things, it's always good to do this with the expert in the field, and statisticians are the experts in statistics. We are not. Yes. 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 Of course. And this is why you need to be there to talk with them, right? Because they can go into their mathematics and be very happy, but you have to check to make sure that it's not pure mathematics; it's actually our problem. So maybe you know, it's unreasonable. The other thing which I was talking to Daniela about just a few minutes ago was to use a log. First time when I heard about taking a log when I work with statistics problem, I was surprised because, you know, you work with the X-ray spectrum and you don't think about logs. You mean, you mean the log of the data or the log of the No, 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 parameters? log of the parameters. Now, the data, data, you know, we do log flux in the magnitude. It's very natural way for astronomers to measure the intensities of the stars, right, the magnitudes. So yes, the parameters. And you take log once. If it doesn't look like normal distribution, you take another one. So you have no log normal, log, log normal. But at the end, you come back to your parameters on your original scale, because this is what you were interested on. But taking a log makes you know something which is very skewed into something which looks very nice. So you know something like that with the long tail, if you take a log, may look like this, right? So you know this point will move into some more or nicer place in the parameter space. So two things, you know, conjugate priors and logs, and you know. This is all for computations and for understanding the problem, mostly. But uh, also for understanding what they're talking about. It's good to understand what it means, right? So if you talk about conjugate, conjugate priors, it means that you know, you're looking at the priors which are in the same family as your posterior. So exponent in Poisson, in gamma, you know, you, you lead to the gamma distribution. Okay. In the same family as your likelihood or your posterior? Posterior. But you, how do you know? 
You don't know. What you know what's your, yeah. You don't know. You can expect because you have the likelihood. Right. So, you know, we started with the likelihood, right? So this is where we go. So the likelihood, uh, this is written for X-ray astronomers, and it's very old uh, way. I guess I found this transparency, and I decided that it's already having some math on it, so it's good to um, show it. So we have the likelihood for some counts given, you know, this is probability distribution for model parameters. There are likelihood of observed counts given this. So we did this on the uh, board earlier. But this is that's pretty general, right? Yes. Yes. Because you measure stars and each of them has certain magnitude, yes. It's very general because that's uh, you know the Poisson if you think about uh, a problem, you come up with this distribution. So for uh, stars, depending what you want to do with the stars, it could be Poisson. If you have a problem, which I, I, I put on the um, exercise list as well, if you, let's say, have a star cluster and you uh, observe stars from that star cluster and you get red giant and white dwarf, it won't be for some. If you want to learn about the population, it will be by model because you, let's say, have just two types of stars in that cluster and you want to know about of distribution of the stars, right? Number of one type and the other type. So this will be by model. For some, is uh, one. Oh, this is priors. Oh, so we talk about. Uh, conjugate priors, and uh, there is something about informative and non-informative priors. See, actually, so this is where I, I didn't give you the example of beta prior. So we, when you look at the binomial likelihood and you follow the derivation, you, you end up with the beta distribution very nicely, which is uh, hard to think about. So don't think about this. This is mathematics, but one can exercise, do this exercise. Yeah, I learned about this from the Wikipedia page of conjugate priors, and it's really useful. Oh, good, good. So there is, oh, oh, all right. So I guess Wikipedia has a very uh, big amount of information now, and. Uh, yeah, for some that's good. So it's good. Yeah, you can go and look at those there. So non-informative versus informative priors. Typically, if you don't know anything about the problem, you have no information. You say, you know, I, I want to get my slope of the spectrum, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's flat between minus 10 and 10. It's not minus infinity plus infinity because the slope is reasonable, but it's somewhere between these two values. So you don't give any information. It will be just continuous and flat. If you know something about that uh, spectrum because you observed it before and you know it's you know, 0.5 for the radio astronomers, the synchrotron spectrum, right? It's 0.5. So you, you say 0.5, and it could be between minus, fa minus 1 and 3, because you're looking at the radio spectrum. And the probability could be higher if you know that the syn synchrotron, so it's not flat in this case. It could be related to the, the electron distribution, for example, in your problem. And you know if you accelerate electron, you, electrons, you get a certain uh, slope. So looking at slope of 10 doesn't make sense. You just look at something which is within the range of your understanding of the problem with some distribution. So you have informative and non-informative priors and conjugate priors. And I think uh, for us astronomers, thinking about priors in general, it's not a problem because we learn 
by reading the papers, studying our sources, we learn about them. I think the problem comes when you have to assign a distribution to that prior, right? And the selection of that prior follows some you know, criteria in the sense that you typically think about function, normal function, or flat. Very rarely about gamma distributions, beta and other ones. Those are the mathematicians coming with the priors. But I, I should say that this, uh, uh, the selection of prior is very important because it's, uh, it is a component of the full model, right? Full posterior distribution. So it is really important that you select the prior which is relative, uh, which is good for your problem but doesn't over-specify the problem. So if your prior is too narrow, you really can force the solution into that parameter space, which is not what you want to do, right? So it's kind of, uh, you know, weighted these values, weighted the approaches. Okay, statistical models, what do I have there? Okay, so, um, I think it's time that we will define some models for some problems in astronomy, <laughs> right? So this is the, the very noisy X-ray spectrum, uh, which uh, Mike Novak uh, showed me a year ago. I think uh, Daniela is still working on that problem. But uh, it's an example of uh, the data in X-ray astronomy, very high resolution data and some continuum fit to this da data. So you have a continuum, which is red line drawn through all these points, and then you have um, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of residuals. In the uh, bottom panel, you have the difference between this continuum and the lines. So in this problem, what you really want to know is about the lines in present in this spectrum. Whether there is any line present, is this all noise, and what type of lines are there. And the problem is not trivial, and you can talk to Daniela if you want to learn about treatment of that problem, because <laughs> it hasn't been solved. But this is an example of the problem. So to set up statistical model in x-rays, uh, you think about the physical uh, mo source model. So it's continuum, some process emitting the continuum. Here I put it F with some parameters and energy. So you define this process on energy scale. And uh, you have the lines, which are written in this uh, strange forms, but these are Gaussian lines. And uh, you have the um, sort of number of lines at certain location and certain widths there. I think somebody is doing the problem here, right, with the lines. Yes? Oh, the void team, okay. Right. Right. Why is it a prior? Oh, it's just because this was <coughs> written in the paper and I just copied the. <laughs> uh, yes, this is the line strand and that's the shape. Yes, yes. It could be. Uh, it depends how you define the problem, but in, in theory, it could be one way or the other. And it's all. And it's not, you know, the, there are two things here, because if you don't know how many lines are there, you don't know your k. So k could be also a parameter of your model. In this case, it won't be, and I won't uh, talk about this, but 
you know, you don't know if you have 10 lines, if you have 100 lines. In the case of Void's profile, um, it's not clear how many lines. I don't know if they use the number of lines as a parameter. Yeah, I think that was the idea with the hash that, that okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That's nice. Very good. So we will we'll hear about that problem later on. Uh, so in X-rays we have calibration files. Uh, so the model we usually think about is in physical space. So flux. Let's say you observed intensity. You you look at the source. Um, in X-rays, you have calibration uh, files or some instrument information. So in this case, we have a source, and we have sort of redistribution matrix and effective area in this sum. And there is also background. So when we looked at this observed uh, counts, actually model counts in this case, this is how we would calculate them. It's, uh, it's similarly also, if you, if you think about two-dimensional models, like uh, image and source in the image, you would include a PSF, in this case, as the instrument uh, component in your model. <coughs> so when you're building the full model, you have to put those into an equation. And I think I, I will have time to show you the example with 2D case later on. Uh, so the likelihood for this Poisson model is here. We already said this is the Poisson, and then the posterior distribution will be defined. So we did this before, right? Uh, this is what we didn't say. So posterior predictive distribution will be when we put our model on the right side, and we integrate over the parameters to get the predictive um, counts, so predictive data, given the observed data. So we have likelihood and the posterior. You integrate, and we get posterior predictive distribution, which is important, uh, as uh, we will show later, if we try to evaluate the, the model. Uh, sorry, evaluate the posterior distribution and the models. So when you build now, these are the equations, but when you build the full model, this is the example of the structure um, built in our first uh, paper with statisticians. So this is David Van Dyke, 2001 paper where we basically defined the Bayesian uh, model for the X-ray uh, case. So we started with the emitted spectrum up at the top in energy and counts <coughs> per some unit of energy. The spectrum comes to the telescope. It's observed, sorry, absorbed, and um, also has the modification to this original shape because of the effective area of the telescope. So not every photon at every energy which lands on the telescope comes to the, um, to the detector. So this is why you have this very weird shape. When you look at the X-ray spectrum, it doesn't lo look anything like optical spectrum. It always has some instrumental sh shape in it. That's your effective area. And absorption is because universe is not empty. You always absorb. Right? <laughs> then we have this instrument response, which sort of splits what uh, comes to the detector. And now the detector gets the counts, measures counts, in the, uh, and uh, because it's not very good resolution. It just broadens the, um, how you say, broadens the energy of the, of the line. So if there was a line, the line is not of the same shape as it was emitted. It's always broadened. 
and also the energies can be mixed. In X-rays, you can have uh, energy photo of, uh, photon of energy six kilo, kilo electron volt, but detected in the channels which are typically sensitive to the smaller um, four kilo electron volt or one kilo electron volt energies. In Chandra, we also have pileup, which means that if the source is very bright, it's it's photon energy which we detect could be not correct because two photons can land at the same location and be read as one photon. So your uh, count and energy of that count could be wrong, right? So you, you basically have the modification of the original spectrum by all these things. And then we have a background component. Uh, not necessarily. It could be, but th in this case it wasn't. So all these arrows point to loss of data. And this is what uh, you know, statisticians and uh, people who work on models uh, also care about, because you want to describe the process in which the loss is happening. So at every level, we lose the data, and somehow this has to be incorporated in the whole process, because that's what we observed at the bottom versus what was emitted somewhere. Oh, there are two lines there, so maybe one of the lines was in that spectrum. It's just the illustration. Yes. Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, in the first step, and typically when you do forward folding analysis in X rays, like XPEC or Sherpa, use your chi square. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, in this case, you only worry about the uh, physical parameters. So in the, in the yes, yes. So in this case here, we assumed that our parameters in the first approach, our parameters were physical parameters, and including absorption. And instruments uh, was fixed. You basically had the instrumental responses and they were fixed. Um, this was 2001. I don't know if I have the case later, but uh, during the last few years, we worked on the approach in which we don't know exactly the instrument para par properties. So all these parameters which describe the ARF and RMF are also parameters of our model. So we have that implementation. It took, took a long time to figure out how this, how this comes into the Bayesian framework, because you, know, you can go to calibration team and tell them, tell us what's your uncertainty on ARF shape. But the ARF. See, we didn't, I didn't think about this uh, as a problem because systematic uncertainties in X-rays are typically propagated, right? You propagate and you add them in quadrature somewhere, blah, blah. Arithmetically. Arithmetically. But for Chandra responses, you can't really do that because the errors are nonlinear. So if you uh, look at part of the soft spectrum and you change the ARF, you affect also the uh, properties of the spectrum detected or the ARF at high energy tail, you know, sort of. It's not linear, so you cannot just shift up and down. You have to do, you know, this thing. So when you look at ARFs uh, generated, they behave nonlinear. So we did uh, describe the variations 
of R using PCA, and we include the parameterization of PCI variability with the PCA components. And we needed eight components to describe the full properties of the uh, ARF. And that was good because uh, you know, this parameterization allowed us to handle somehow this uncertainty and then include it in the analysis. Uh, so it's important, but when you uh, take this into account and we did the simulations, it happens that the uncertainty uh, is only, this uncertainty is small for low number of counts. If you have a very bright source or you know, observed source and you got 60,000 counts in your spectrum, like in X-ray binaries, for example, this is where uncertainty, calibration uncertainty, really broadens your uh, parameter uh, distributions, the errors or uncertainties. All right. Good point. So the strength of this approach was that we could put this, oh, it's actually here. We could put this uh, uncertainty into this framework. So in Bayesian, analysis, after you define the model, you find your uh, priors, what you do, you go and you run simulations to see how your posterior, or see, or uh, find your posterior distributions. And it's simple, as it's in this graph, oh, it didn't, anyway. Okay, so I have it on, this, on the next one, which is a bigger graph. So what we had the model and the prior on one side. We draw parameters. We compute likelihood and posterior probability given those parameters. And then we accept, reject, and update parameters. And depending on the acceptance reject criteria, you have a different chains, right, MCMC chains, which we'll talk tomorrow about. So you accept, reject, and move back around. So you do this loop. When you compute the likelihood and posterior probability, you compare data. So you take data calibration, you compare. So in this one uh, block, you do everything. So this is sort of schematics. And when we uh, applied calibration uncertainties, it was very natural to put this into this calibration box. Instead of using one value, we could use, you know, we could vary that parameter. So we could use, move the calibration onto this draw parameter and connect those, right? So you had data, you draw parameters from the model, and model includes the calibration in it, and you compute likelihood and posterior probability and go and uh, get your posterior. So with the calibration problem, there were few tricks because when you take the, uh, this description of PCA as the calibra calibration uh, uncertainties, right, the distribution of calibration values, uh, you also don't know if that's everything you know about your calibration. So you could... Uh, also learn about the calibration. So whether can you use the data now to learn about your calibration of the instrument, the parameters of this calibration. So this took a lot of discussions at the formal statistics level because you start thinking about using data twice. Can you actually do that in a formal way? And it's uh, possible, we did it. There are two papers <laughs> which came up after this with full description of, uh, of the problem and uh, uh, two graduates uh, in statistics. So two people who graduated. No, one was the student, the other one was our postdoc, so. But it can be very, very simple for, for us. Right? For us, yes, yes. 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 
Yes. Yes, so, yes, exactly. This was like, so what's the problem? Why can't we just do it? No, 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 no. It was, it was Johnny Meng and David Van Dyke talking about it at the board for a long time. So, yeah, it wasn't, uh, I guess because when you do this first time, you always have to ask yourself if, if that's the proper formal way of dealing with these problems. Are you introducing anything which is strange, how it will behave? So yes, it was. Uh, so I, I really like this photograph because it, it relates to one of my favorite things is uh, EDM chocolate espresso. Oh, right. Okay. So it starts with everything you will do a breakout on, on PGM. using those to understand the chocolate and the caffeine and the flavor and the go. Okay. And it would be good for us to remember this picture. Okay. Doing a, right. Right, right, right. And then we can, we'll be able to see that reappear in these graphs that we'll draw this afternoon. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. So, so in, the, in the afternoon, are you going to do this movie of this appearing, disappearing, or it will be just the static? No, it will okay. be at a whiteboard drawing. So oh, white, okay, whiteboard drawing. All right. I was, I was imagining the animation where things <laughs> pop up. <laughs> no, no budget, <laughs> whiteboard animation, very good. Any more questions here? Yeah. yeah, I should ask you guys more questions. Are you asleep? <laughs> all right, let's move forward. So we did all these simulations, right? Uh, this is just uh, one slide of uh, what comes out of MCMC. I think everybody saw this, seen, seen this before, because it's very popular now. We have two things to remember. One thing, you always have to look at the trace uh, of, your, of your chains, always. This is very well-behaved train. You should say what a trace is. Oh, okay, sorry, trace, okay. So when you, when you do, uh, yes, when you do the simulation, MCMC simulation, you have iteration, right? So when you go through this loop, you, count one, two, three, four, and you have this iteration. And Markov chain, so when you have this uh, accept, reject criteria, it tells you how to move through that parameter space. It's a random walk. Uh, it's a random walk, but you, know, you always look at the previous parameter where it was and accept, reject ba based on that parameter. So you forget, right, but it links. So chain, uh, sorry, chain and trace, right? Trace would be the location or the value of that parameter in the iteration, basically. And you can look at, if your model has five parameters, look at the traces for five parameters, each individual, because one could be very nicely behaved like this one, which means you, know, you see very uh, random uh, behavior flickering like this. And the other could be just you know, going flat, not changing at all. It means that your problem is not really being properly solved, right? Do you have an example of one that's not well-behaved? I can bring it up uh, later. It's not in the slides. Tomorrow, actually, I think uh, there will be more on the MCMC tomorrow. So I can prepare some very badly behaved chains, yes. But uh, this one is very good. So when you look at your chains, you right away know whether it was uh, properly set. And if you don't, then you have no idea what you did. So I think this is a this is lesson for every uh, astronomer who wants to run MCMC. They, you have to look at your traces. If you don't, you just don't know your problem. Even if you get a value at the end, you just don't know. And I can repeat this over and over because I've seen things. <laughs> so you, <coughs> looking at the traces, then in this upper graph, I made the scatter plot of the two parameters which were in the problem. So there is the slope and the absorption. And as you can see, the uh, the scatter plot is kind of uh, 
stretched, not stretched, squished and elongated, uh, which indicates that there is a correlation between these parameters. It's not very nice symmetric. There is a correlation. And then at the bottom is the PDF, so probability uh, density for this photon or slope, which is uh, what we draw earlier on. So this is, uh, if you take the other one and look at this just marginal on this, on this um, space. So it's very nicely, this distribution is very nice. It looks like Gaussian in this case, right? Sort of like a Gaussian. So this was the question of how do I now take the, this information and publish? So we don't. We just uh, typically say, you know, this is the photon index of, what, 1.25, and then take this 68% uh, or 90%, because this is nice Gaussian shape, and then do, you know, 1.25 plus or minus 0.6 or 0.05 in this case. Yeah. Right? So that's what we publish. What you want to show is your distribution, because if it's not nice, they are like, like in this case, but looks like uh, this, let's say, uh, which happens. So I can draw a few, ca for few cases. So one could be like this, right? This is your parameter. The other case could be, let's say, like this. So. I mean, what happened here? Can you say what happened here? This is, uh, let's say this is my 1.2, and that's 2 when I draw. <laughs> yes, it could be something wrong with the prior. It could be that, uh, you know, data doesn't tell me anything here. Right, that my da my data is basically uh, no has no uh, take or no value, no constraint before that below that. So, you know, if you see this, you it's it's nice and perfect. But if you show this in the paper, then somebody knows that you know your quality of the data wasn't as good as you would think, and you know, there could be problems because if that's just the, you know, this part of the parameter space which you are able to constrain, then it means that we need to have more data or try something else. In this case, it's something different, right? We have, uh, this is our, let's say, peak. Uh, I'll get to, to this uh, quickly later. But you have something which behaves very nicely on that side, but then it has a long tail. So it means that you know, your data, in this case, doesn't constrain your you know, high value at all. It can be anywhere there, too. So in, in reporting a point estimate, right, if you do maximum likelihood analysis and uh, maximize your likelihood, forgetting about whether or not you use the prior. But you know, like you maximize your likelihood, you will report that point value, right? the value at that location. So this gamma will be gamma best. And then, then you will say, you know, maybe this or maybe you know, like higher. So anyway, this, this would be in the point estimate. But if you supply the full posterior distribution, then it's a better understanding for the reader of what happened to your problem. OK, we better move. So this is the, uh, the ad other, I guess I have this uh, few slides on uh, how to report your analysis later. So you're looking at the posterior probability. And uh, in this case, we. You know, we work with the one line for that problem. So there is the line location at you know 2.8 has very strong peak, right? That's very strong uh, 
uh, evidence for the line there. And probability the line, line is there. And posterior probability density looks like this when I zoomed in into that region. So it shows the peak, which in this case will be call, will call mode, right? The mode is always, um, if there is one mode in the distribution, that's the mode of the distribution. But you can have bimodal distribution, which means you can have a you know, few modes. Maybe let's do this differently, like this, right? So you can have two modes, and your data tell you maybe then this one has, uh, you know, is sort of higher right, than this, and uh, more likely perhaps than this. But you may want to know that there are two modes. It, it is possible that this mode is unphysical, and you can just say, well, I don't care about this one because it basically cannot happen in my problem. Maybe that's okay. Right. I mean, you know, we are not perfect, right? <laughs> if we were perfect, we will solve everything by now. So, yeah, you know. But well, you know, it's it could be that your uh, range of parameters, let's say, went to the uh, place where it shouldn't, right? If you have your gamma at ten and you know that the gamma cannot go above two, then maybe. But there are reasons where you, you may want to explore the parameter space outside what you think is reasonable. Expanding your belief temporarily. Yeah, uh, not even temporarily, because uh, as we heard yesterday, discoveries happen when something unexpected happens, right? Yes, exactly. So, you know, there are mistakes which lead to discoveries too, right? So if you by mistake did something and then suddenly you saw the peak somewhere else, right? I don't have an example now, but, you know, that's maybe where you discover your Higgs <laughs> particle or something. <laughs> it's not that I, you know, I, I think this is the way to discover it, but... Yeah, uh, okay, so bimodal distribution or multimodal is kind of tricky because, first of all, it's very hard to use the maximum likelihood approach, let's say, to, c to get the maximum likelihood, even using standard classical methods. If you think about multimodal parameter space and uh, optimization methods which are based on gradient, so optimization searches in this parameter space looking at the gradient, or, you know, like simplex and uh, even, you know, levenberg markov which is just uh, uh, reversing the problem. I mean, this, these methods may lead to local minimum, <laughs> first of all, and uh, may have trouble in uh, researching the full uh, parameter space. This is why MCMC and Bayesian approach, or Bayesian approach with MCMC, is beneficial. Because in astronomy, we, we often deal with these problems. I mean, th this is very simple, but, you know, if you have 10 parameters in this 10, 10 dimensional space, you definitely find places where you, you have some modes, little modes. So anyway, so it was about the mode. So you characterize the distribution by mode, by uh, mean, by standard deviation, if it looks like normal. You can also look, t look at the joint posterior distribution. So this is a two-dimensional one. So if you have two lines instead of one, and we looked at the posterior distributions for locations of the two lines, it could look like this, which was uh, in our example. 
There was like the, the dotted line and then a little smooth one where you start seeing bumps. So in this two-dimensional parameter space, it's kind of, uh, you know, you can see that you have, it's not um, like contour-like or scatter-like. In this case, these are location of the lines, and they are very well sort of constrained to certain parts of the parameter space. <coughs> so when you think about summarizing your distributions, and summary statistics, this is a posterior. There are three uh, examples here. So typically, we look at the right one, right? We have probability density, uh, which is the solid line. And then when we do Monte Carlo, we get these histograms. So that's normal, right? Then we have the uh, highest posterior density. Oh, those are the same. Those are wrong. All right. Are those the same? It, this is not a good example. All right. Because it's, it's that. Uh, yes, but I, I was just wondering if the graph. Oh, no, the graph is good. Right. Right. <laughs> because it's not as dramatic as I was expected. <laughs> so, yes, the highest posterior density is where you, you, know, you look at the 68% here of the era in which you have the uh, most of your uh, posterior contained. And this left one is equal tail. So you look at the, um, if this is the Gaussian, then you have the equal tail of the Gaussian, which gives you 68%. In this case, um, it will be the equal tail. So everything inside of this equal tails would be what is my Uh, I think I had a question. Uh, well, I think that's what you normally do when you use the Gaussian distribution when you report. For the Gaussian distribution, the highest posterior density and the equal tail will be the same. Yes, but, but that's how you when you have when you have a non Gaussian one. Gaussian, yes. Why would you use? I mean, when would you use equal tail and when would you use highest posterior density and why? Well, you know, I would just plot my distribution. And uh, typically, it's very hard to, um, I think in astronomy, we typically work with equal tails. And that's what we report, even if it's not a Gaussian distribution. Really? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but ex exactly, that's the region. Mm -hmm. Would you use the highest posterior density or, or the other one? Uh, do, do you not have this question? When I have a posterior, I want to say the value is not a confidence. Confi confidence. confidence. The, yeah, well, it's credible region. Credible region, right, which contains the 90 or 68% of your but posterior. The highest posterior or the equal tail? Uh, in the credible region, you're looking at the top down. So you're looking from the top, it's the highest density one, right? right? I guess it's the smallest range. The smallest range, sort of, yeah. Yeah, when you start. So I don't know if I have that plot, but if you have two modes, I mean, you can, uh, or maybe here. See, there you go. This is the example of, uh, of this line in the spectrum and the difference. Oh, that means the yes. Yes. And this is why you don't typically report that in uh, astronomy. Because you know, for this problem, it was actually good to have the HPD, because we wanted to know where the probability for the line locations are, which you separate those and you see where they are. While when you look at the equal tail, you can see that you know it could be anywhere, and it's not what you, what your problem was. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it's also it's 
it depends on the problem, you know? It, it depends on the question you pose. Um, Yes, and plots, right? Yes, so yeah, I can repeat to everybody in the, uh, yes, in, Daniela said that in the paper, it is very important to write what you did. Yeah, all right, so this is another illustration. Okay, let's go to model checking. Just looking at the time. Uh, okay, so we have the posterior, we have everything, and we had the model, uh, which we really liked, and we saw everything we learned about the model based on our data. Now we have to check if our model actually is correct and what happens. You know, do we were, were we right? And uh, there are a few ways of uh, doing this checking in, uh, so in Bayesian, yes. Anita, this is kind of like the Bayesian equivalent of do computing the reduced chi-squares. I wouldn't even go there. <laughs> you cannot talk about reduced chi-squares. No, but you can. I mean, this is yes. Yes, so if you, you know, I should not say, if you have a normal problem, problem which can be described as normal Gaussian, then chi-square approach is fine, it's yeah. perfect. And you have the uh, chi-square goodness of fit test. So there are two things. There's always a confusion between statistic estimator and the chi-square distribution. And I think right. this is, a problem which is often confusing people too, because somewhere someone calls statistics used to fit the data chi-square, and it propagated, but it's just the estimator. It's not the actual distribution, which is something different. So your goodness of fit test for normal data is based on the chi-square distribution. But this is kind of a goodness of fit test in uh, the Sort of, yes, because you're looking at the, uh, you know, goodness of fit test is just, uh, it's hard to say. This is the check of how well you specify the problem and how well you can predict the future data from your problem, right? So yes, you do the check. You do the check in the sense that you take the posterior, you calculate your posterior predictive uh, data, so what happens, and then you compare this data to your posterior. Does this new predicted data come any close to this, right? So if you happen to find your new data new stars somewhere far away, I mean, doesn't make sense, right? You, you solve something different. It's not applicable to this model. So you do this through the simulations. Uh, and I don't think there is the analytical way to do this. You know, there are information criteria later on. We'll talk about it. But uh, to do the check, you typically explore the posterior and explore it in the um, simulations, and do the simulations checks. Uh, one thing is that you need this uh, test, right? You need some test to um, validate the date, uh, the, 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 the model somehow. And uh, you describe this magnitude of discrepancy between the model and the data and we can use the p-value, which we sort of understand from the classical tests, right? And here it's the Bayesian way when you have some um, test um, statistics, so some measure of the difference between differences between the new and the, I mean, new data, predicted data, and this. Uh, so you have some probability 
that the, uh, this uh, replicate data come from uh, this uh, posterior, uh, which we described. So you have to have some statistics to do it. And uh, likelihood and likelihood ratio could be used to define the statistics. One thing which you need to uh, do before you even go there to test, uh, I guess we're going to the hypothesis test because this sort of touches the hypothesis test. Because when you evaluate the uh, model and checking this model, you want to accept or reject the model, right? So this is sort of the hypothesis test. And we're checking whether our model agrees with it. So there is the p-value, uh, which is the probability that uh, this, uh, uh, the new data uh, fail, I guess, that's the test, of new data come within the uh, posterior, which we just defined. That's, an, that's not the right way of saying, I guess. Uh, well, we will have an example later on. But uh, uh, let's say we have uh, yeah, we actually I, I think I have an example on the next slide. Yes, okay, this is the uh, the one. Yeah, this is calculating PPP value, posterior predicted p value. So in this, uh, what I was uh, I started to say was that when we do the test, we uh, define the level, so probability at which we accept or reject. And we have to do it a priori. You cannot, after doing the test, say, oh, I didn't mean 0.01, I mean 0.5, or something like that. Right? You have to, before you start this exploration, you define the uh, level, alpha, you know, p-value. Is it always the same level? No. No. Doesn't need to be the same. Depending on your problem, you can say, you know, if actually it's it's touching uh, probably a few things because traditionally we you, we say you know value of uh, zero point one and uh, p value of zero point one can be used to reject some model, right? If we get values lower than that, let's say. 0.01, sorry, 0.01. Point, oh one one percent. That's, that's, that's like almost the same one, I think. Yeah, 99%. Yeah, so it's, it's there, okay. right? Yeah. But depending on the uh, way you specify the problem and whether or not you use uh, some information from the data, your level of the p-value could be way too high. You may need to go in the tail of this distribution and say, you know, point oh 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 one is the one at which I have to run my test, my check. So your p-value, if you set p-value a priori too high, then uh, you know you may not uh, get the right results. And I think this is kind of a problem of p-values, which has been discussed very intensely over the last year or two. I don't remember now. But there was a lot of discussion, probably a year ago, about p-values, you know, two years ago, being completely bad, bad. Don't use it because you get the wrong information. We just, you know, we don't have anything better, right? So this uh, view of p-value um, in both communities, or oh, actually mostly statisticians, because there were some results which were um, accepted at this some levels and then they were not correct. Right? I, gu I guess the question is how much does it hurt if I make a mistake? Like how much does it hurt if I think my model is correct when it's not? Or appropriate when it's not? Well, yeah. I guess that's that's a good question. So if you have a discovery and your p-value is wrong, then you are hurt 
because the discovery is not discovery, right? So there you have to be very careful. If you have a result which agrees and you know it's sort of a ballpark number of what everybody expects, then you know it's probably okay. Uh, so it all depends on the application, and I think people should be very careful uh, when uh, they see something new. So you can talk about p-values, but you have to find some other measure to confirm your discovery. And I, I would say some people should be more careful, maybe. Because of course, everybody jumps. So I can tell you that one day it happened to me that I discovered something. But I saw it, you know. <laughs> I looked at my Chandra data, and I saw this data, and I went home. I woke up next morning, and I realized that what I saw was a jet in my source. And it was really, really exciting. This was uh, one of the longest uh, X-ray result jets with which we know. It was Parks 1127, and it was really exciting. And it was a discovery because I saw it by eye, but I wasn't sure because in Chandra you have the readout streak, and readout streak can confuse you, right? Instead of the long jet, you may have the streak which looks like a jet. And the jet wasn't known to anybody in radio community, so uh, I spent Sunday, all day Sunday, basically, <laughs> investigating, and uh, the readout streak was in a different direction than the jet, and the jet was there. We found the PhD thesis publication where the radio astronomer published an image, and we went to VLA and got a good VLA data to confirm it, so it was fun. And uh, yeah, I can tell you that uh, I was surprised that such discoveries can happen in 20th century, 21st century. It was really good. It's cool that you, you made that discovery while visualizing in data space. Yes. So one of the points that um, Andrew Gelman makes in, in the red book is that even before doing this quantitative analysis by making replica data sets and looking at test features, he advises to, to just visualize things. Yes. To, to do the, the model check in sort of visually first to get a feel for what's going on, like looking at the residuals, right. looking in various different right. ways. Right. But right. in data space, comparing the predictions that your model is making with the observation that you yes. actually had, yes. which gives you a lot of guidance and you know, yes. enabled you. Yes. Yes. I have a comment on this because I work with a lot of data that has a lot of correlated um, that's usually correlated processes, so the kind of stuff that you can model with a Gaussian process. And if you look at that data, especially if you look at data, that data and sort of as a time series over long uh, time scales, you often see patterns mm -hmm. in the data that are actually pure noise and where your brain confuses you into thinking there's patterns in there when there's actually no patterns in there. So that's the kind of flip side of this. It's good to look at the data, but looking at the data can also fool you into thinking you've discovered something when you've discovered nothing. Right, so maybe yes. we should use the term data space to include transformations to other useful summaries of data. Right. So if you're yeah. confused by the, the, by the actual light curve and your predicted light curves, maybe you see it clearly in the Mellon transformation of that, oh, of yeah, that you light <laughs> curve. But it's still data yeah. space, right? You're yeah. still looking at data or summaries of data rather than parameters. Right, right. And that's what you, know, that's what you do. You generate the posterior predictive data, right, given your model. So you do look at the new data which you collect in the future, right? This is uh, in future experiment what you expect. Agree or not with your current data. That, that's so. the data given that your model is true. Yes, yes, yes. So you simulate, you simulate, you have a model and then you simulate from that model what's the sum? 
with the sampling distribution, and then you compare these simulations? Yes. Uh, so let's say, yes. Um, so this is, uh, I think this leads to this one. Uh, oh, I show it to Erin. <laughs> this leads to this one. So I think I have maybe more detailed description of it later, but we, we can talk about it now, because this is the example in which uh, you do two things, right? One is to calculate the predicted value. I mean, you always calculate the predicted value based, based on your model, to stereo PPP value, right? So the distribution sort of here. So this is our distribution and then the PPV value of the data um, from your model and data from some other models. So if, if in this particular case, uh, on the right side, let's say, right, if you have your distribution as in this histogram and your PPV value marked with the line or somewhere within that distribution, you would say that it agreed, right? So this would sort of tell you the, that uh, there is an agreement. Where, say, your Y... Well, don't y go there be now because that's a different thing. <laughs> so that's why I was saying that the, the, the test on the bottom is kind of uh, not what, uh, what we're talking about now. Uh, so in the left diagram, we have the value which is at the tail of the distribution. And if I get from my model the value like this, I would say that it's very unlikely that this future observation comes from that point. So now we're going to what's actually plotted on these graphs. So the, you have a question, Phil? Mm -hmm. So s some of you who are interested in, in Bayesian inference, you may already have uh, analyses set up where you have samples from a posterior PDF that you drew with MCMC or something. A good hack would be to write some code that enabled you to do this kind of analysis. So for each sample in your chain, you would make a replica data set, including noise, using your generative model, mm -hmm. and then visualize that in, in suitable ways, and then design test statistics that capture some feature of the, of the replica data, and then may try and make these distributions. So this is a histogram where each point going into the histogram is an MCMC sample from your posterior, where you've made a mock data set, and you've evaluated the test statistic on that replica data set. And then the, the line is where the, test the same test statistic function on your observed data where it fell. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a great hack would be to, to just build the machinery that enabled you to do that visual check followed by test statistic check to allow you to play this kind of game. Um, should we take a break and come back to this example in 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. All right. So we'll come back at uh, eleven twenty-five. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Okay? No, I have to wait until the mic warms up. Can you hear me back there? Okay, good. All right, so <coughs> we come back to this uh, uh, test in a few minutes, like a few slides. Uh, we start with this one. This is the cartoon. Uh, I think statisticians don't like that cartoon because it's not really correct uh, <laughs> in, in many ways, but uh, XKCD cartoon about Bayesian and uh, frequentists. So the neutrino detector measures whether the sun has gone nova. And uh, somebody say, oh, then it rolls two dice. If they both come up six, it lies to us. Otherwise, it tells the truth. Right? So let's try detector. Has the sun gone nova? Detector says yes. So you have the approach from, from frequentist and Bayesian, and this is where the controversy comes. So the frequentist says the probability of this result happening by chance is 1 over 36. Since, since the p-value is less than 0 0.05, I conclude that the sun has exploded. The Bayesian statistician says, bet you $50 it hasn't, right? So there are many problems with this cartoon. And uh, you know, it kind of illustrates the discussions between one camp and the other camp, which is, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like it's not relevant, the discussion between the two anymore, because we're following Bayesian ways. But when you think about this, the first thing comes to mind is about the first, you know, top of this test, you know, the design of the experiment, which is very important. If you design the experiment, you know the probability of the dice roll, right? And you basically know the result and the, qu the answer right away. So, you know, you can say anything. So that's where the problem is. And of course, you're asking a question, which is, by our knowledge, impossible <laughs> to answer by that experiment. So it tells you, you know, a lot of things about uh, you planning the scientific experiment, which is actually pretty nice, right? So you have to think about it. You have to think about what you want to answer, and what you, and how do you go to to test that answer. That's where you set up the stati statistical model. But somebody posted this on their doors in our hallway. It was pretty fun. Um, by the way, what is the probability of the sun exploding tomorrow? You can calculate that in a Bayesian way. You can decide, define the model and calculate it. <laughs> knowing anything you know about the sun. <coughs> so model selection. We're going back to our model selection. So the classical uh, test, chi-square goodness of fit test, which is based on the chi-square probability distribution and degrees of freedom, uh, the F-test, and the likelihood ratio test. And depending on the... Uh, I guess the approach you're taking, you can say these are the classical tests and they are good. Uh, they were, were very uh, common and very good in the classical way or classical sense, in classical statistics, because the probabilities were tabulated. We didn't have computers, so you go to the table and you read from the table and you know whether your p-value is this or this, right? What is the p-value and whether you accept or reject. And I was confused by those tables. So when, you know, when I started my uh, research, we had to use the tables. There was nothing else. There was no computer to calculate probability distributions. So I was always confused by the tables. So I'm ha happy we don't have to use them. 
Oh, we, we could, but we don't have to go and read the table. We can run the experiment. Oh, OK. I was going to delete some of this from that, but it's probably OK. So Bayesian model selection, uh, you can think about the, uh, the uh, base theorem and calculate odds, odds ratio. Uh, I think I got confused. Anyway, the odds ratio, which is the, for given models, what is the probability of, 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 of obtaining one or the other, right? And the base factor is that uh, given the model one or given the model two, what is the ratio? What is the factor? So um, I think this is, this is in a wrong place. It shouldn't be here. This is what it should be there, OK? Uh, all right, so we're going back to the uh, base theorem. So we have posterior data given model. likelihood and prior for the model. It's written in a different way, so it's a little confusing. But we have all this, and we, we have to calculate this global uh, likelihood, the evidence. So we have to integrate uh, over all parameter space when you do this. And when you calculate that, uh, the calculations could be very difficult. And uh, you know that in uh, base factors, you have to integrate over parameter space and over priors. And when you do that uh, numerically uh, for your n-dimensional parameter space, it could be very hard. It can take time. And that's why calculating base factors hasn't been the primary way of uh, selecting a model in astronomy, I think. Does anybody have a nice way to calculate base factor, to do integrals? Nested you. sampling. Nested sampling, all right. <coughs> That's true, the nesting sam nested sampling could uh, do that. So the, do they calculate the, or you have to actually write your own code to do the base factor, or it comes out when you do the? I compute the marginal likelihood. OK. So I compute that. that yeah. OK. Um, but that's part of it, and right? Then you, you have to do for two models, yeah. Right. So uh, we did the comparison for the x-ray problem between base factors and p-values at some point. Um, this hasn't been finalized, I guess. But uh, one thing to remember is that there is no number. So base factor, similar to p-value. You cannot say, if my base factor is 10 or 20, then this model is better than the other. It all depends on the uh, problem, again. Uh, so it's very non-intuitive to use the model selection with the base factors, just because of that uh, uh, Why number. Why does the problem? I mean, doesn't the base factor or the odds ratio just give you odds that you could then spend mm -hmm. money on? It should, yes. But if you integrate, so I guess the normalization is the, 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 the of the problem is the question. It's, it's hard to do properly. So in our example, our test for accepting the line, or evidence for the line, right, using p-value and base factors. So for the p-values of, uh, you know, PPP value, I would say less than 0.01, our base factors were still of the order of 20 let's say, which would tell you that this model wouldn't be there in that case, that the evidence for the line, I guess. If I remember that correctly. So they were not, you know, they were not 
close to one, we just want you to think about the odds ratio and base factors. And you know, if the odds is one in ten or one in hundred, I mean, is it the right way to think about that this odds, right? I mean, what is the in your problem, what would be the odds for you to accept your or reject your model? It's the same as when you think about p values, kind of, right? It's just phrased in a different way because you're not looking at distribution, you're looking at the number. Um, right. Oh, and these are the model comparisons, yes. I'll skip, you know, this is, yeah, this is, this is important, but it's just calculations, I say. And uh, there are also information criteria which are used. So you have base factors, you have predicted, posterior predictive p-values and information criteria which are based on, uh, based on the deviance, which is, if I pronounce this correctly. So it's the um, sort of the deviations, right? So log predictive density of the data given the point estimate of the fitted model. So here you use uh, point estimate, so it's maximum likelihood, for example, in your model, versus the predictive density probability of the whole. Um, whole model. And the one criteria, so, you know, this is the AIC, so I, I CAC, I guess, uh, criteria, just, uh, you know, this is log of likelihood of M, and it could be chi-square, for example, so it could be applied to classical uh, model selection as well, where you add this corrections which are based on the number of model parameters and number of data points, and you calculate that uh, value. And then you select the model, and this is the example for different, uh, this is some of the uh, models with two parameters, P and Q, and uh, for one of the parameters we change the uh, we calculate this AIC and we change one of the parameters and you can see that for P of 4 and 5, you know, these uh, models are basically giving you the same sort of value, so they are equ equivalent. In this case, we know that the models which give you very high negative values in, this, in our calculations are not well describing the problem. So all the ma and and this is also the examples where you start adding the parameters. So P is kind of adding more and more parameters to the model. And you can see that above four, if you add or five, if you start adding more and more parameters, you don't learn more about the model. So in this case you would use the model with the smallest number of parameters. You don't over parameterize the model. Um, oh, okay. So I think, I don't know if we can, sorry, this is, um, I think I wanted to go back to the PPP model. There it is. We come back to this, this example. Um, all right, so there is, you know, I just showed ICACA criterion. There is uh, Bayesian criterion, deviance criterion. So all of these criteria, information criteria, differ, differ in the way they integrate over the posterior and how they describe the posterior. But they all compare the you know, posterior predictive with your maximum likelihood or posterior in some case. Mode of posterior. All right. So I think I need to talk about this example because that's the test that Daniela asked me to talk about. And this is the example of, of the 
hypothesis test or model selection test, where you observe the X-ray source in this case, and you ask whether there is an emission line in that source. So um, this is the paper, uh, Protas of et al. paper published in 2002. And this was uh, the paper which took us a lot of fun to do and work on. And the referee asked us to give examples of bad usage of uh, likelihood ratio test and F statistics for that problem. And I remember Alana Connells uh, coming to our room with piles of ABJ, actually, of printed out versions from ABJ, and we were putting them on the pile and testing. So it was an interesting experiment to see how many people used this test in a wrong way. So the paper describes all the details of uh, a problem and the approaches to the problem. The main <coughs> issue is that uh, you apply likelihood ra ratio test, but to apply likelihood ratio test, you have to understand what is this, this distribution of that test. What is the probability distribution? And often, you just use the table or something, right? You assume normality, and uh, this uh, graph actually shows you the likelihood ratio test statistics distribution, which is you know, in this uh, histogram. So this is the simulation of the distribution of the model. Sorry, the, the distribution of the likelihood ratio test statistic using the null model. So the model which we fit to the data without the line. And then the solid line corresponds to the chi-square distribution for the problem. So when you look at this graph, let me see in the other part. Yes. So when you see, what you see in this graph is that this chi-square distribution is very different than your likelihood ratio test distribution. So when you do the test, you do simulations to describe the distribution. You cannot just go and use the chi-square distribution because it's not the same. So what people did were they used the likelihood ratio test or F test, assuming that it's Gaussian and assigning the uh, values for acceptance or reject, rejecting the model based on that chi-square distribution, which was incorrect. Because your likelihood ratio test statistics looks very different. A, B, C are different. Yes, I will. Yes, this are posterior predictive. So um, there it is. These are the steps. Yes, so what you do, you do one, you've, I think maybe this description is on, because you can do the test for the classical, you know, simulations for classical approach in the Bayesian. It depends on how you um, calculate your posterior and the, you know, whether you use the prior in all this procedure. So you fit the model, I mean, fit the data with your model which contains a line or not. So you have two models. One is the null model, there is no line, or no source, if you're looking at the two-dimensional data. The other one is with the data and the line. And you look at the likelihood ratio test between the two, right? So likelihood ratio. You obtain the distribution of parameter for par parameters of this model. So you assume a simpler model for simulations, which will be the a model with no line. And you simulate the data. So you calculate the posterior predictive sample from that simple model, right? So this is where your simulations generate you 
the predicted data. So if you had no line, this is what the distribution would look like. And then in the next step, you fit the line with the model, simple model, and with uh, model with the line at each step of the simulations. So you basically generate this likelihood ratio test distribution, because you do the test at every step. right? So you not only simulate the, uh, the big sample, you simulate the sample, but you also calculate the ratios. And then you, so you build this probability density, which is uh, on the bottom one, this histogram. And uh, the line on this histogram marks the first likelihood ratio calculation or test calculation were, which was based on the data. So I didn't plot it he marked here. So the histogram is what we simulate in this whole simulation scheme. And the line marks our data. Right? This is where we were, where we did our experiment. So it tells you how far, uh, let's see, yeah, oh, I have this, how far you are within this distribution. So if you go back to this, um, let's see quickly, um, <coughs> to this distributions, right? So we have two cases here. Uh, in one test, our PPP value based on this ratio was 0 0.018 somewhere in this tail. And in the other case, it was within that. So these are the result of the simulations which I just described. And our test statistics, this is for one line and this is for the second line. You know, they are shown here. So you would accept one, maybe, depending on you know, how uh, your p-value for rejecting the simple model, rejecting the model with no line, what was your favorite value. And the one here, you would uh, accept the null model, the simple model, in this case. So, uh, we have these uh, steps here. This is in the handbook for X-ray astronomy. Keith Arnau, uh, Randall Smith, and myself, myself published a book a few years ago. It's handbook of X-ray astronomy. It has everything you wa want to know about X-ray techniques, detectors, the calibration, the statistics related to uh, X-rays is in that book. And that flow chart is there. These are the steps. Let's see. Okay. Oh, I have. OK. All right, we go back to the examples. I think I need to wrap up quick, quickly. But I have a few examples if people want to explore them later uh, in, uh, you know, during the afternoon or tomorrow. Um, that you can go and look at the uh, example of using the MCMC chains in Sherpa. That's the uh, Python package for um, modeling and fitting, and it includes MCMC. And there is a notebook, which I just pointed to, uh, written by Doug Burke, one of our colleagues at Chandra. So it basically runs through two-dimensional analysis of si on simulated data and shows you how to do it. Um, it goes to the uh, exploring the you know, parameter space and traces. So this is the trace and looks pretty bad in that example. And uh, tomorrow you will learn how to characterize these uh, traces and how to formally uh, doing the, you know, calculate the uh, numbers, which tells you whether or not there was something wrong with your trace. But you know, this is, this is the, these are the things here. So you can try this. And the, uh, in this histogram, it shows that there are a few modes. And uh, 
you know, you look at the full posterior and then, you know, graphs of the different parameters. There are many parameters in that problem, you can see. So that's one thing. I will put the links into our uh, web pages so you will be able to access those. The other example is Lira, which is one of our, uh, oh, I think I crashed this. This is the um, reconstruction of two-dimensional data, Bayesian uh, low count reconstruction. So it assumes Poisson data and it uh, is the algorithm which uh, has been developed over the last 10 years, I think. Uh, slowly, well, 2004 was the publication of first uh, algorithm by Ash, uh, our students within Chask, and then uh, the code, which is there, you can see, two or three years ago, four years ago, uh, was put on, doesn't have the license, so I'm going to put the license on that page when I'm here. Um, it is the, ra uh, the code is in R, but the post-processing uh, tools are in uh, Python. And what the code does, or what the algorithm does, is uh, to, it includes the point spread function and works on your image. Uh, you define your model for what's in the image, sort of like the baseline model, null model with, uh, let's say, one source at the background and the PSF. And then you, at the end, you get MCMC images of the resulting uh, posterior. And you can look at those images and infer the possibility of extended structures there. And we used it um, recently. There are still problems, statistical problems, related to interpreting the uh, results of MCMC simulations and detecting a structure which you suddenly find in M MCMC images. So this is what we're working on right now, trying to understand whether what you see by eye in MC MC result is actually a detection of some extra emission in the data. I was going to, maybe I have a picture. No, yeah, I had a picture, but it just disappeared when my comp computer crashed. So I can um, go into details if people are interested in image analysis and uh, detecting uh, structures in images, diffuse emission, jets, uh, extra points. Uh, we can talk about it. And then there's the example, I think, of modeling time delay, which uh, I guess we don't have a code right now, but this is the example of a hierarchical model. So maybe at one of these breakout sessions, we can talk about hierarchical model, which we built for this time delay problem. It was Hinsuk Tak, uh, who was very excited as a grad student, statistics grad student, when we time delay challenge from LSST paper came out. And uh, you know, I showed him the paper and he, I think this was Phil who sent us the, the first description of the paper and the data. So Tuck was jumping up, up, up very, very happily. And uh, he said he, he was going to do it. So this was, what, two years ago? Yeah, so this was his PhD thesis, basically working through that problem. And uh, so he, you know, you see two light curves from uh, Lens Quasar. One is the, uh, the one image and the other one is the other image. And uh, what you want to find is the time delay between these images. So in the very simplistic approximation, uh, you just assume that uh, you have uh, some model which describes the light curves. We assume that this was a U process. And then uh, you look for the shift in your time axis and shift in your 
magnitudes, and these are the parameters of the model. So when you build the hierarchy here, you have some you know, light curves which you uh, model as OU process, and the parameters of this OU process are not really interesting to you. You just describe this variability, and what you really want to do is to find the shift. So this is sort of this hierarchical structure where you start building your levels of uh, you know, parameterization through the hierarchy of the problem. So, you know, we're not going into details. We can talk about it. Um, if you like uh, to discuss either of these problems when I'm here, and uh, if you have any questions. If you have any general question right now, you can ask, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, we have two minutes before the lunch, right? Or you want to talk to they say something? Um, if well, there are questions, I think first, we are there. First, let's uh, thank uh, Neda. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I don't have a summary slide. I can have a summary slide, but I don't. Um, are there any uh, quick questions? Mm, no. Or, all right, we'll follow up in the afternoon then. Yes, I think, you know, the, the, this was three hours, right? I've been doing this for 20 years, okay, <laughs> not lecture.